I'm Nurse Tanishka Morris, the manager of the clinical care unit here at Bahama Health. On behalf of the management and staff of Bahama Health, we want to welcome you to another session of Docs Talk. For the month of November, we are observing Diabetes Month, which is a condition that is very prevalent here within our society. And so we've invited a panelist consisting of Dr. Ariane Davis Simmons and Dr. Christine Parker Curling to share their expertise on this non communicable disease. Welcome again. Good evening, everyone. Uh, we will be introducing our very first panelist. She was born in Freeport, Grand Bahama, and she had completed medical school at the University of the West Indies and specialty training in internal medicine at the University of Maryland in Baltimore, where she served as chief medical resident. Uh, she then pursued her subspecialty training in endocrinology diabetes and metabolism at MedStar Union Hospital, graduating in June 2019. Uh, she is a board certified in internal medicine and endocrinology by the American Board of Internal Medicine. Her interest in diabetes and endocrinology began in her early training of medicine, um, spurred by the diagnosis uh, of diabetes in her father and type 1 diabetes in her nine-year-old niece. She initially began um, watching them struggle in different ways with their diagnosis and management and knew that if she understood this field, she could make it easier for them and others to successfully maintain their health despite of very real challenges. She is experienced in providing advanced medical care in the areas of diabetes, thyroid disorders, thyroid ultrasound, thyroid biopsy, medical obesity management, pituitary, parathyroid, and adrenal disorders. Her expertise includes the use of the diabetes technology, such as insulin pumps and continuous glucose monitors in diabetes management. She is excited to return to the Bahamas and to realize her passion of serving the community that has inspired her to pursue her career in endocrinology. I am happy to invite our very first panelist, Dr. Ariane, Davis Simmons, welcome. Good evening. Um, let me set up my slide, share screen. Thank you for that introduction. Diabetes 101 or Diabetes Basics. Um, this is a brief outline of some of the things we're going to be talking about today. Um, so there's a few key facts I'd like to start with. So one in seven Bahamians have type 2 diabetes. One in three have prediabetes. Diabetes is a silent killer. So many don't, are not even aware that they may have this disease. Um, it is the seventh leading cause of death worldwide. Uh, major cause of blindness, kidney failure, heart, um, heart attack, strokes, and lower limb amputations. We know that healthy diet, regular physical activity, maintaining a normal blood sugar, avoiding tobacco use, uh, avoiding excess alcohol use are all ways to prevent and delay the onset of diabetes. And that, you know, diabetes um, can be treated in all of its consequences and complications of or delayed um, through simple measures such as, you know, diet, physical activity, changing your lifestyle, taking your prescribed medications, um, doing uh, follow-ups and regular screening uh, for uh, complications. So I wanted to start with a little bit of a kind of physiology of what we eat. So as you see, this is like a very classic um, Bahamian plate. So when we eat food, food is broken down by our digestive sim um, system into um, more simple agents. When we look at carbohydrates and starches, those are what is broken down into sugar. Uh, and sugar, also known as glucose, is the main fuel um, and energy source for the body. So the way we have been created, um, our body works in a complex way to maintain normal blood sugar status. So this is how the body should work. So when people who don't have diabetes, their blood sugar stays within a pretty tight range of 70 to 120, regardless of what they're eating. If they don't have prediabetes, diabetes, or risk of diabetes, they can eat you know, pretty much whatever, but the sugar stays tightly controlled. And it happens because insulin is released in the right amounts at the right times. Insulin is a hormone made by the pancreas um, that is a key that opens the door to allow sugar to enter the cells and to be utilized as energy. 
in diabetes, multiple things go wrong that lead to high blood sugar. So the main three, it's complex, but the main three things that happen are either the body is not making enough insulin or the insulin that it is making is not working as effectively. We see that in um, type two diabetes and the insulin isn't working as effectively due to insulin resistance. And also the liver can be making too much insulin leading to also to high blood sugar. In type one diabetes, the main culprit is, or the, the major culprit is that the body is not making enough insulin because of destruction of those cells that make insulin. So the issues with diabetes really occur is because that high sugar over long term um, is pretty much toxic to the, the cells, to our vessels. Um, symptoms of high blood sugar include increased thirst, um, increased urination, blurry vision, which usually happens when blood sugars are over 250, feeling more tired and fatigue, uh, poor wound healing, being more prone to infections. You can have weight loss. And this is, again, because the fuel is unable to get to the cells. So you have a wasting away um, of, uh, of your body. And then the extreme conditions you have, um, you could have nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, um, and entities called either diabetic ketoacidosis in type ones or hyperglycemia, hyperosomolic state uh, in type twos. And these are emergencies and these patients are usually managed in the ICU and there's a high morbidity mortality um, risk related to that. So, um, all of the complications are due to high blood sugars. Uh, my colleague, Dr. Christine Parker Curlin, is going to elaborate on this in her next talk. Uh, but diabetes is the leading cause of blindness, kidney disease, um, nerve damage, which leads to amputations, and it's increased risk of um, also macrovascular disease, such as heart attack and stroke. So there are three main um, types of diabetes. There is type one, which is autoimmune, meaning the body is making something that attacks those cells that make insulin. Um, and these individuals will require insulin, insulin therapy to live. Then you have type two diabetes, which is the more common form occurring in more than in 90 to 95% of patients who have diabetes. Uh, in this one, in this form, there is insulin resistance. The cells are not using insulin as well. Um, and over time, um, the insulin production may decline, but that is not the primary um, issue in the beginning. And then you have gestational diabetes. This is diabetes that happens in pregnancy after um, 24 weeks of gestation. The placenta is actually making um, hormones that are resulting in insulin resistance so the mother's insulin can't work as well. This leads to high sugars in pregnancy, which could affect baby. Um, and usually it, it, it will resolve once uh, baby is delivered because the placenta is no longer there. Um, however, it's important to remember that individuals who have just women who have gestational diabetes are at increased risk of developing type 2 diabetes within five years, um, and also their children are at increased risk of developing type 2 diabetes. So with type 1, it's more, it's more um, less common. It's 10% of the diabetes population. We used to think of it as only happening in children, but it can really happen um, at any age, but we tend to see it more in children and younger adults. It is autoimmune. Um, the body is no longer making insulin and insulin is always going to be needed for this treatment. This is just a, a picture showing the top picture showing a child with type 1 diabetes before starting insulin therapy. And the bottom picture is showing a child uh, three months after starting insulin therapy. Um, it is now 100 years of the discovery of insulin um, as of this year. And it just shows you, this picture shows you that insulin has changed type 1 diabetes from a death sentence to a chronic disease process. So what is prediabetes? So prediabetes is the phase before the development of diabetes, hence the name. Uh, again, it happens in one in three adults. The sugars are abnormal, but it does not reach the range of um, criteria for diabetes. So type two diabetes, most common form, it is very, it is tied to 
obesity. So as people have become larger over the years, we're seeing more um, diabetes prevalence. And at diagnosis, men, men who are diagnosed with diabetes, 50% of them are obese. Women diagnosed with diabetes, 70% um, are obese. So they definitely go, go hand in hand. And both diabetes and obesity are nearing um, uh, epidemic um, proportions. So what are the risk factors for diabetes? At the top, it's going to be being overweight or obese. This increases your risk of developing diabetes. It is because as we increase with the number of fat cells, the fat cells produce uh, fatty acids that would lead to insulin resistance, so the insulin can't work as well. And then over time, the fat cells also produce cytokines, which are inflammatory markers, and over time can lead to decline in insulin production. Sedentary lifestyle, so not being very active is a risk factor. Having a family history of type 2 diabetes is, increases your risk of uh, diabetes. So if you have one parent with diabetes, you're at increased risk of 25% of getting um, having diabetes. If you have a sibling with diabetes, you have a 7% increased chance. So family, um, family history is very important and increases your uh, risk. History of gestational diabetes, having polycystic ovarian syndrome is another risk factor, again, through metabolic syndrome and then increasing your insulin resistance. Uh, advancing age, so age over 45, um, and as we age beyond that, our risk of diabetes increases, even though now we are seeing type 2 diabetes occurring more in young people um, as we are becoming more obese. And then being non-white uh, is a risk factor. So Blacks, Hispanics, Asians are at increased risk in comparison, in comparison to our white counterparts. And then lastly, if you have um, hypertension, uh, high cholesterol, expanding waste, um, metabolic syndrome, essentially, you are at increased risk of diabetes. So how do we diagnose it? Um, so there's a few simple ways. You can do an A1C, which is a blood test that looks at your sugar control over the past three months. Uh, if your A1C is over 6.5, you have diabetes. If you have an A1C of 5.7 to 6.4, you have prediabetes. And if it's less than 5.7, that is a normal blood sugar. So I have a lot of patients who say, oh, they told me I had a touch of sugar, I have a touch of this. I mean, it's either normal prediabetes or diabetes. So it's important to notice that concept. If you have an elevated fasting sugar, so that's your sugar first thing in the morning, greater than or equal to 126, that is diabetes. Um, if you have a random sugar greater than 200 with symptoms of diabetes, that suggests a diagnosis of diabetes. And then the last test, uh, is something called an oral glucose tolerance test. This is still like the gold standard in diagnosis, uh, but we tend to do this more in pregnancy. And this looks at how well your body handles a sugar load. And if you have a sugar greater than 200 on that test, you have a diagnosis of diabetes. So let's talk about diabetes management. So diabetes is complicated. So any disease that you have to think about on a daily basis, you have to manage what you're eating, you have to monitor your sugars, you have to take your meds, um, can be a lot. So having a diabetes care team um, is essential to really good care. So that can be composed of your primary care physician or your endocrinologist, um, diabetes specialist. It may include your diabetes educator. Uh, it should include your podiatrist, especially if you have um, foot issues already. Um, your dentist, if, if you have diabetes, you should be seeing your dentist you know, at least twice a year. Your ophthalmologist at least once a year. Um, your dietitian. Also with diabetes, because it is um, a, a long-term disease, some people develop depression, anxiety in relation to their disease process. So another important member of your team may include a psychologist or therapist. So how do we treat type 2 diabetes? So it does start with lifestyle as the cornerstone, which will be your education, your healthy eating, getting up getting moving, getting active, and then also monitoring your blood sugar.
Uh, it may include medications, which can be oral, non-insulin injectable therapy, and uh, insulin therapy. So there's a, something called an alphabet strategy, um, looking at you know the A, B, C, D, E, F, uh, G of diabetes, and this just helps to classify the management, um, so you can keep it straight uh, in terms of um, your care. So the first is going to start with your advice. Um, controlling your BMI, which is your body mass index, controlling your blood pressure, which is uh, important also to prevent kidney disease, looking at cholesterol levels, monitoring your diabetes control, eye exam, feet exam, and guardian drugs. So advice. So first thing your doctor may say to you is you have to change your lifestyle. Um, if you're a smoker, you should cut smoking. If you are um, using excessive alcohol, which for men is more than two drinks in one sitting, for women more than one drink in, um, in a sitting, your doctor may ask you to change these lifestyle um, measures. They may ask you to get some exercise uh, and change your diet. And we have a lot of data in terms of lifestyle. So with the diabetes prevention uh, program, they showed that you can prevent diabetes or the progression of diabetes from prediabetes to diabetes by just losing 7% of your body weight. Um, avoiding the excess alcohol, um, getting in less simple carbohydrates, stopping smoking, and then exercising at least 150 minutes per week, which works out to be 30 minutes, uh, five days a week. And the Finnish um, diabetes prevention study kind of echoed this, where they said just losing at least 5% or more of your, of your weight can prevent the progression to diabetes. So lifestyle is definitely the cornerstone for prevention. It's important to get healthy food in. So we, have, we use something called the plate method. If you have a plate, you divide your, divide your plate into quarters. So half of the plate, so two quarters of your plate should be green um, leafy vegetables, non-starchy vegetables, which include your broccoli, your cauliflower, your asparagus, your green beans. Uh, a quarter of your plate should be protein and a quarter of your plate should be starches. So it shouldn't be, your plate shouldn't have two or three starches. You have one, one starch and that should be um, portion controlled. It's important to read the labels. So this is another important advice. So if you look at this label, it doesn't seem like it has a lot of calories or carbs, but there are two servings per this container. Um, so it's important to look at serving size, look at the calorie count, especially if you're trying to lose weight, and then also look at the carbohydrates. So carbs are, are broken down into sugar and this will impact your overall blood sugar. The B of the ABC is BMI. So body mass index, this is a measurement of weight for your height. Um, and these are the healthy ranges. So 19 to 24 BMI is healthy range. 25 to 29.9 is considered overweight and anything over 30 is considered obese. So when we think of prediabetes, diabetes and obesity, um, we would, I already talked to you about the strong relation between um, the entities, but it's important also to know that again, for prediabetes and diabetes management, if you see the orange, um, bar lifestyle therapy is going to be the first approach. If you are overweight or obese, your doctor may even prescribe medications to assist in weight loss um, to help you aid in weight loss to prevent the progression of prediabetes to diabetes. Um, and then they may add on diabetes medication afterwards just to control the blood sugars. So there was a study called the Stampede Trial, which looked at um, obese individuals with type 2 diabetes, um, so BMI over 30, um, and also BMI of 35. So there were individuals who underwent either just medication treatment for the diabetes management versus um, intense diabetes medication control and then surgical options. And what they found is for the obese group who ended up having surgery, they had improvement in their diabetes. So they had decrease in the medications that they required. They had improvement in A1C. And um, for, uh, um, for some of them, they even had remission of the diabetes where the diabetes went away. So we know by just reducing the weight you can have, or significantly reducing the weight you can have um, resolution of the diabetes, the type two diabetes, it can go away. So the next B is gonna be blood pressure. So at baseline, your blood pressure should be less than 140 over 90. 
these um, goals can be tailored by your doctor. So if you have other risk factors, um, they may tighten the control. Uh, again, blood pressure can help reduce the um, risk of heart attack, stroke, and kidney disease, along with staying healthy, weight, um, getting exercise, and then limiting alcohol. And when we looked at um, several studies, they showed that increasing blood pressure along with um, elevated A1C were directly linked to complications of diabetes. So by controlling those measures, you can then prevent complications. The next C uh, in the ABC is going to be cholesterol. Um, cholesterol is the sticky substance that blocks up your arteries, leads to heart attack and stroke. All patients with type 2 diabetes over the age of 40 should be on a cholesterol reducing medication. And it's actually not all about the numbers, it's actually about reducing your risk of heart attack and stroke. And that is a recommendation by the American Diabetes Association. Uh, but if we do look at numbers, goals should be less than 200 and the bad cholesterol, um, it should be less than 100. So D is gonna be for diabetes control. Uh, how do we know if our diabetes control is there? It's going to be by monitoring your sugars. Um, if you have diabetes, if you're on orals, you should be checking at least once a day. If you're on insulin therapy, you should be checking um, three times a day or more if needed. And if you, and obviously you're going to get your A1C, this should be done every three months to check for your sugar control. And these are your targets. Before meals, your blood sugar should be 80 to 130. Two hours after meal, your blood sugar should be less than 180. And if you're not meeting these targets, this is a, a good sign that your diabetes is not controlled and you should follow up with your primary care physician or your endocrinologist to optimize your therapy. Um, what is A1C? So A1C, I said, is a three month check that looks at your sugar control it looks at how much sugar is bound to your hemoglobin. So the hemoglobin is your protein within your red blood cell. Uh, and this is the chart. So if you have a A1C of seven, that means your average blood sugar is around 150. And American Diabetes Association um, goal for most patients is gonna be have an A1C of seven or less, which has been shown to decrease complications of diabetes. So this is just looking at Again, the algorithm of how we treat diabetes. So how do we add on medications? So first we said lifestyle, um, weight loss management, and then we're gonna add on medication. So the first kind of medications we add on are things called like metformin and type two diabetes. And then if you are overweight or obese, we will consider adding medications that help with weight loss. Um, and those are medications such as GLP-1 receptor agonists or SGLT-2 inhibitors. Uh, and they have been shown to not only help you lose weight and control sugar, but reduce your risk of heart attack um, and stroke. Diabetes is complicated. So I gave you the three basic things that happen that go on to lead to type two diabetes, but it is more complicated than that. And the medications we use are targeted to help with this um, physiology um, defects that happen in, in diabetes. So the medications are added on in a thoughtful manner um, to not only control sugar, but reduce your risk of the complications of um, diabetes. And I always like to highlight that diabetes is a progressive disease. It changes over time. And meds that once worked 10 years ago, um, you may need to have um, escalation of therapy where medication needs to be added on. Uh, and that is just the nature of the disease because over time, insulin um, will decline as we age. So it's, uh, um, <clears throat> a silver lining is there's a new, a lot of diabetes technology out there that helps to make life easier with diabetes management, um, including the continuous glucose monitor or sugar monitor. Um, these are devices that you can wear on your body. They're about the size of a 25 cent piece. Um, they monitor your sugar um, every five minutes and they can send it to your smart device, your phone, your iPad, your smartwatch. So they help you with monitoring the disease um, so that you don't have to prick as much to know what your blood sugars are doing. Um, there's also insulin pumps, uh, which can talk to the sensors to help you deliver your insulin. Um, and this diabetes technology field is something that has grown uh, exponentially over the past 10 years um, to assist in um, diabetes management. So E is going to be for eye screening. That should be at least once a year. Um, F is going to be for foot screening. 
If you have diabetes, you should be checking your foot every feet every day. You should wash your feet in warm water, not hot water. You want to make sure your feet is completely dry. When you lotion your feet, you're going to kind of um, avoid in between the toes so there's not increased moisture leading to breakdown and ulcers and wounds. Uh, you're never going to go barefoot inside or outside. Uh, you're going to wear shoes that fit well, trim toenails straight across, um, don't remove corns or calluses yourself. If you have callus problems, you probably should probably see a podiatrist to get shaved. Um, and you want to see your healthcare provider and your feet should be checked at um, each visit. And then lastly is the guardian drugs. Your doctor may choose to add on some of these medications to not only um, to, to help prevent the complications of diabetes, um, such as heart disease, stroke, um, kidney and eye disease. So this is a summary. Type two diabetes, we talked about prevention and management. Lifestyle is the cornerstone. Important to take your meds as prescribed. Monitor your blood sugars. It's important to know your health numbers. And this is what I have listed. These are, should be your goals. It's important to get a healthy uh, BMI and have regular screening for complications. And I think the, the most important thing to remember is to be an active participant uh, in your care. And that's it, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Davison, as that was a extremely informative presentation that you did. Uh, we will power forward into our, our next um, physician who will be presenting this evening. This will be our second panelist. Uh, she is uh, a Bahamian board certified physician and specialist in the specialties of internal medicine in craniology, diabetes and metabolism, and obesity medicine. Uh, she collaborates with the primary care physicians and a multidisciplinary team in the management of patients with diabetes, excess body weight, and endocrine disorders and concerns. And she also enjoys opportunity to interact with medical students afforded to her as an associate lecturer at University of the West Indies. Uh, she is a wife and mother of two, and enjoys athletics, music, and time with family. Uh, she provides inpatient consultation services at Doctors Hospital, and her outpatient clinical practices are located at the Family Medicine Center on Blake Road and Concology Consultants Limited on Nassau Street, New Providence. I wish to uh, introduce our, our second panelist, the one and only Dr. Christine Parker Curling. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, let me screen share and then I want you just to confirm that we are on the same page. Yes, we're ready. Thank you. Okay, um, so uh, thank you, Dr. David Simmons. That was a wonderful explanation about uh, diabetes and the pathophysiology. So we will continue the talk with um, a few reinforcements of some of those concepts and then we will spend a little more time talking about um, the complications of diabetes, which is one of the aims of treatment of diabetes to, to prevent symptoms, to prevent progression of the disease, and also to prevent complications. And so, which is what we just uh, kind of summarized. So what is diabetes? We've just learned that it's a chronic meta metabolic disorder characterized by the impaired ability to metabolize carbohydrates. Uh, we've also learned that um, prolonged elevations in blood sugar can cause damage to the blood vessels. And this is the major mechanism by which uh, diabetes complications occur, okay? Um, there are many complications of diabetes, and uh, Dr. Davis Simmons talked about some of the acute things that can go wrong, including elevated blood sugars, yeast infections, blurred vision, uh, frequent urination, difficulty with wound healing. But what we're going to talk about now is the chronic complications of diabetes, because these tend to be uh, the most concerning, and also um, these tend to impair the long-term quality of life, and, and that's why we're so um, focused on them. So the chronic complications of uncontrolled diabetes are concerning, and why do complications occur? Elevated blood sugars cause damage to blood vessel walls, okay? And blood vessel walls, when they are damaged, they respond by developing or, um, a plaque-like substance, so a sticky substance that can line the blood vessel walls. And so oftentimes I explain to my patients that blood vessels are like little pipes, 
right? And the same way a steel pipe is not designed to carry a fluid that's rich in salt, um, your blood vessels are not designed to carry uh, a fluid that's rich in sugar. And um, a continuous exposure to elevated bl um, blood sugar levels can lead to damage to these blood vessel walls. And this is the main mechanism that accounts for diabetes complications. And so blood vessel walls can become narrow, they can become weakened, and these blood vessel walls can also rupture, okay? And it's the changes in the blood vessel walls and the changes in the blood supply to different parts of the body that mediate the chronic complications of diabetes. So when we talk about complications from diabetes, we're really talking about compromises in blood flow. And so we characterize the, complication, uh, the complications of diabetes as either damage to the small blood vessels, and we call that microvascular complications, or damage to the large blood vessels. And we call those macrovascular complications. So we'll spend some time talking about the vulnerable blood vessels in our system. And those would be the, the tiny blood vessels of the eyes that lead to diabetic retinopathy or damage of the retina. Um, the blood vessels that supply the kidneys lead to kidney disease in, in uncontrolled diabetes. And of course, there are little blood so, um, supplies that give circulatory um, nourishment to the nerves of the feet. And, and when you have, we talk about the diabetic foot and diabetic peripheral neuropathy, those are the small blood vessels that are vulnerable and that become damaged in uncontrolled diabetes that happens over a long period of time. Now, the larger blood vessels are those that supply the brain, those that supply the heart, and those that supply the large blood vessels to the legs. So we're gonna spend some time talking about the complications in the small blood vessels and the complications in the large blood vessels. Why is this important? This is important because many studies have shown that poor blood sugar control, poor blood pressure control, and poor cholesterol control contribute, contribute to the chronic complications of diabetes. A diagnosis of diabetes, especially when it's long-standing and uncontrolled, will decrease a life expectancy. And when we add cardiovascular disease and myocardial infarction or heart attack to that mix, we decrease the life expectancy even further. So the stakes are very high to implement changes to try to decrease the complications from diabetes. And of course, we, we talk about complications all the time, but the good news is that complications can be prevented, uh, they can be delayed, and the progression of complications can be slowed if we um, find complications early on and intervene. And how, how do we prevent complications from developing in the first place? And how do we prevent progression of complications? Well, we do this with excellent comprehensive management and by meeting the management targets that were introduced to us in the previous talk. So as a patient living with diabetes, what should you be doing? As a diabetic patient, you should be attending your regular routine primary care visits that everybody should be doing, okay? And then you should be monitoring your glycemic targets, your A1C goals, your cholesterol goals, your blood pressure. Um, and then you should be doing regular screening for complications of diabetes and preventative management to prevent the development of things like cardiovascular disease, including heart attack and stroke, okay? And then also you want to be aware uh, that in patients with chronic medical disorders, that there can be a tendency to develop depression because it can be an overwhelming thing, an overwhelming thing if you are not adequately prepared, okay? So in your routine primary care, your age-appropriate cancer screening, your immunizations, your checkups, that's what you're going to be doing. Then we're going to talk about the glycemic targets. Meeting glycemic targets helps to prevent complications, and that's why we're reiterating this in the second part of this talk. You should always know where you stand, you should know what the goals of therapy are. You should know your numbers and what they mean and what the implications of those numbers mean. Because I'm sure that Dr. Davis Simmons will agree that we find that patients who are educated become empowered to make changes even outside of the clinical setting. And a patient who is empowered to make changes is usually very motivated. And so I find that empowering patients with education allows them to make behavioral changes to improve their blood sugar on their own. Okay, so apart from your routine primary care management, we're going to talk about diabetes specific management. As a diabetic patient, again, you want to know your hemoglobin A1C. What percentage of your hemoglobin has been altered because of high numbers or because of prolonged exposure to high blood sugars? You want to know what your percentage is, and you also want to be empowered with the tools to lower that number because the higher that number is above seven, the higher the risk of developing complications from diabetes. 
Um, so we know that A1C in most cases should be below seven. The fasting blood sugar we've already talked about should be below 130. Um, and how often should you be checking these things at least daily of your blood sugar and at least every three months if you have uncontrolled diabetes and you've not met your hemoglobin A1C target. We talk about the weight loss of at least five to 7.5% decreases the development of diabetes and starts to improve diabetic control. When we talk about lipid management, we want to have all of our patients above 40 with a history of diabetes on cholesterol lowering therapy to decrease their first event of cardiovascular disease. And of, of course, if you've had a cardiovascular event, that being a stroke or a heart attack, um, these particular groups of medications have been shown to decrease the development of a second one. So those things are called primary prevention. Primary prevention is the initiation of a change or an intervention to decrease the likelihood of developing a first event. And then secondary prevention is in a scenario where you've had a cardiovascular event and we want to decrease the likelihood that you have another one, okay? And so that group of medications is called statins. Well, suvastatin, pravastatin, you will, you will, you know, as you read and come, become more familiar with your care, you understand the group of medications that we are referring to and why we want to initiate therapy in a lot of our patients, even when their cholesterol levels seem to be under control. Patients with living with diabetes should have excellent blood pressure control. And we talked about our interventions for blood pressures above 140 over 90. But if you also have high cholesterol, diabetes, high blood pressure, sugar, um, high blood pressure, then we try to be even more intensive in our management because at that particular point, you have three things that are putting massive assault on the integrity of your blood vessels. If you have cholesterol damaging your blood vessels, you have blood sugars damaging your blood vessels, and you have high pressures of, of blood flowing through your blood vessel walls, then you have three things assaulting your blood vessels. And so we are even more aggressive in lowering cholesterol, lowering blood pressure, and lowering glucose to prevent the damage to the blood vessels that leads to the complications from diabetes. Okay, so we're gonna start now talking about those complications that we kept alluding to before. We're gonna talk first about the microvascular complications of diabetes, which refers to the damage that can, that can occur in the tiny blood vessels. Why are we screening for these things? We're screening for these things because if we can find evidence of damage to blood vessel walls before you develop clinical disease, then we can prevent the development of clinical disease in the first place. Or if we can find microscopic evidence of damage to, to your blood vessels from uncontrolled diabetes, we can, initiate, we can initiate even more intense therapy to prevent progression of those complications. And a lot of times you can pick up evidence of complications occurring even before you develop symptoms, okay? So let's talk about the kidneys first. This seems to be the first thing that I chose. The kidneys are very important, okay? And when we talk about um, diabetes affecting the kidneys and causing the decline in renal function, we call that diabetic nephropathy. Diabetic nephropathy increases the risk of end-stage renal disease 25-fold, okay? And it accounts for at least 30% of the cases of end-stage renal disease in the Caribbean. And up to 30 to 40% of patients with diabetes can develop diabetic nephropathy or damage to the kidneys from uncontrolled diabetes. We should be screening for um, evidence of kidney damage from diabetes at the initial diagnosis in type two diabetes. Whereas if somebody has type one diabetes, we feel that we've made that diagnosis kind of very soon after it's occurred. So, you know, after about five years of, of type one diabetes is when we would initiate screening for diabetes or diabetic nephropathy. And we want to screen, like we said, so that we can intervene early and so that we can introduce medications that have been shown to decrease the progression of kidney dysfunction in patients who have diabetic nephropathy. So when I say to you that we're going to screen your urine, your urine, what's happening? So we know that we have two kidneys, generally in the population, we have two kidneys. And the kidney is basically a big filter, okay? So when we look at this kidney on the right-hand side, um, the functional unit of the kidney is called a nephron. So we're going to take a microscope and skip over to this left-hand diagram. And basically, the, the nephron is the basic filtration system of the kidney. So the blood comes into this little filter system, 
it circulates in this little um, kind of filter and it comes back out and goes toward your circulation. So when blood enters the kidney, the bad things are supposed to come out and go into the urine and the good things should remain in your blood vessels and progress back to your circulation. In a patient who has chronically uncontrolled diabetes and you have damage to these blood vessels, as the blood flows into the kidney filter system, good things start to leak out of the blood vessel, okay? So when we think of protein, we think of protein as a good thing. So if you have damage to the integrity of your blood vessel walls, little bits of protein can start to leak out of the blood vessels and appear in your urine. And that is called microalbumin, okay? So what we do is we screen for evidence of microscopic amounts of protein in the urine. You will not pick that up on the routine urinalysis. And when we see microscopic amounts of protein in the urine, your kidney function is actually still normal. But this is a nice warning sign that has a significant lead time before the development of declining renal function that allows us to intensify your blood pressure management, intensify your glucose management, and also initiate medications that prevent the progression to renal disease. And that's why screening is so important. Um, the next thing we're going to look at is the group of blood vessels that supply the nerves to your feet, okay? So we've talked about nephropathy, which is kidney damage. We're going to talk about neuropathy. Diabetic neuropathy. So any patient diagnosed with type 2 diabetes and type 1 diabetes really should have examination of their feet. Okay, so we're going to look at the, the feet themselves. We're going to look at the presence of hair. We're going to look at the coloration. We're going to feel your pulses. And in various forms, we're going to check basically sensation in your feet. So I want to be able to differentiate a patient who is losing sensation from a patient who has normal sensation. Why is this important? It's important because if you are not feeling something, then you're probably not going to look at it. And the example that I like to use is about your elbow. So the average person doesn't look at their elbow, but if you scrape your elbow, then you're gonna, you know, prick your arm and try to inspect your elbow to see, well, what's hurting? So if you have a scrape on the bottom of your foot, you're gonna look at it. If you do not feel it, you could have a scrape on the bottom of your foot, three or four or five days later, you might smell something. So by the time you smell something, it means you've, you've had a break in the skin, you've had the introduction of bacteria, you have an impaired immune system, so you, you're very prone to developing complicated infections. And so by the time you realize that something has happened, we have progressed significantly. And so what we do when we screen you for your ability to feel, if we see any impairment in, in your uh, the function of your nerves, we educate you and we also send you for further evaluation, perhaps by a podiatrist to recommend for you protective footwear and further uh, intervene with preventative measures. Why does this happen? Well, if we take a look at this diagram here, we can see what a healthy nerve looks like. And when we look at the screen, we see that there's a tiny little blood vessel that supplies oxygen and blood to the nerves. Um, if you have, can you hear me? Are we okay? Yes. Yeah, oh, yeah. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Sorry, I thought I heard an echo. If you have compromised to the blood vessels that supply the nerves, then the nerves become starved of oxygen. And so if your nerves are starved of oxygen, they are going to be impaired and they are going to lose their ability to feel. And that is one of the underlying mechanisms that leads to decreased sensation, inappropriate walking, the development of calluses. And of course, now you have a callus, you have a break in the skin, the introduction of bacteria and the progression to what we call diabetic foot ulcers. So we're screening for that because we want to prevent that from happening. The third, the third set of vulnerable blood vessels, which are tiny, are now the ones in the eyes, okay? So patients with type 2 diabetes should be screened for diabetic eye disease or diabetic retinopathy at diagnosis, okay? Diabetic retinopathy increases the risk of blindness 20-fold, and we can prevent diabetic retinopathy and prevent the um, progression thereof with improved glycemic control, blood pressure control, and lipid control. So what happens in diabetic eye disease? Here we see a healthy eye with nice blood vessels supplying the back of your eye. The eye is a wonderful organ because the physician can take a look with their ophthalmoscope and actually look at the blood vessels as they course over the retina at the back of the eye. 
if blood vessel walls become weakened, they can develop aneurysms and aneurysms can, can break and hemorrhage behind the eye. If the blood vessels become very narrowed, then the part of the eye that has been starved of oxygen can start to, to show changes. And we see these as cotton wool spots. If the patient has chronically low oxygen to the eye because each of the blood vessels is very narrow, then the body will try to compensate by making more blood vessels. And of course, initially this sounds like a very good compensatory response, but the haphazard way that the body is making these emergency blood vessels behind the eyes quite inefficient. And the blood vessels that you manufacture under this stressful circumstance are actually abnormal blood vessels that become very leaky and become prone to rupture and hemorrhage. And so patients who have chronic low oxygen in the eye because the diabetes has caused narrowing of those blood vessels, they develop new blood vessels, but they develop new abnormal blood vessels that can bleed and cause hemorrhages. And of course, blood, when it, when it um, coagulates, will contract. And that can actually cause a pulling away of the retina from the back of the eye. So diabetic eye disease can become very complicated. And so if we are screening, we should be sending you to the ophthalmologist at least annually so that we can do things to intervene to prevent the development of complicated um, retinopathy or diabetic, diabetic eye disease. So, so far we've discussed the pathophysiology of diabetic eye disease, diabetic kidney disease, and the nerve disease that affects the foot leading to diabetic neuropathy. Let's switch gears now and talk about the large blood vessels that are vulnerable to damage from chronic elevations in blood sugar, along with chronic, chronic elevations in blood pressure and cholesterol. So coronary artery disease and cerebrovascular disease, in layman's terms, heart attack and stroke, are the manifestations of um, chronic damage to the larger blood vessels of the body. And uh, there is no evidence that screening for these things in the absence of symptoms has changed the outcomes. What changes the outcomes is decreasing the risk of developing heart attack and stroke. And that is um, in, by means of decreasing cholesterol or optimizing cholesterol, optimizing blood pressure management, and optimizing your hemoglobin A1C or your glucose management. And of course, this is the underlying theme through both of these talks, prevent, prevent, prevent. Okay, so you want to decrease the risk factors that predispose you to developing heart attack and stroke. And that is the blood pressure, the cholesterol, the hemoglobin A1C, and probably smoking should be added to that list. Why do we do these things? Why do we preach this again and again and again? Because multiple studies, and of course, we look at this uh, Swedish National Diabetes Register, and we look to the development of death from any cause, stroke, or acute myocardial infarction in diabetic patients. And the simple explanation of these three graphs is that as the hemoglobin A1C goes up, so does the risk of death from any cause. As the cholesterol goes up, so does the risk of death from any cause. And as um, the blood pressure goes up, so does that risk. The same holds true for stroke and the same holds true for myocardial infarction or heart attack. The higher the A1C, the higher the cholesterol, the higher the blood pressure, the higher the risk of damage to these blood vessels that leads to blockage of the blood vessel and starvation of those um, muscles that are supplied by that blood vessel that causes heart attack. Or in the case of a stroke, if you have blockage of the, of the blood vessel that supplies a certain part of the brain and that part of the brain becomes starved of oxygen, then and that part of the brain dies because it's, it's starved of oxygen, then whatever function that that particular part of the brain is responsible for mediating will be lost. And that can have significant and devastating outcomes in terms of your ability to function. And so along with um, blood pressure, cholesterol, uh, and blood sugar management, other therapies like the lipid lowering therapies and aspirin can decrease the risk of a second event. And in a certain population of patients who are very high risk, we might even consider initiating aspirin therapy to prevent a first event. And then also the choice of diabetic medication, um, like Dr. Davis Simmons alluded to, some of these things will decrease the risk of hospitalizations in patients with cardiovascular disease. So we might tailor your therapy based on your particular risk factors. I thought I would include this slide because it's not typically included in the chronic complications of diabetes. We think about heart attack, stroke, we think about eyes, we think about kidneys, we think about ulcers. 
but the blood vessels that supply the lower extremities or the legs are also vulnerable to chronic blockage from high blood pressure, high blood sugar, and high cholesterol. And when those blood vessels that supply the lower extremities become critically narrowed, patients develop what we call peripheral vascular disease. So it's like a heart attack of the leg, let's say, where if you have an acute or even a chronic blockage to the blood supply to the feet and the toes, then that chronic lack of oxygen supply can actually cause death to those tissues. And so smoking cessation, diabetes and blood pressure control are also very important in preventing this complication and recognizing that this can occur in diabetic patients at an increased rate is important because if you have leg cramping, difficulty walking, non-healing wounds, if your leg feels cold, if you're losing hair, if the toes look a little blue, then you might be sent for an evaluation of the supply of blood to your legs to rule out what evaluate for peripheral vascular disease because that can allow us to intervene surgically and medically to try to improve your circulatory uh, situation in your lower extremities. And patients with peripheral vascular disease are prone to developing diabetic foot ulcers. So finally, what we talked about now was all of the medical and objective and obvious things that can happen from a compromise of blood flow in patients with chronically uncontrolled diabetes. We talked about already that patients with a chronic medical disorder can be at risk for developing depression, for feeling overwhelmed. So it should be considered at a diagnosis of diabetes. It, could, it should be considered at least annually. It should be considered by the patients themselves. If you have relatives with diabetes, watch out for behavior changes. Watch out for self-neglect. Watch out for evidence of the patient losing interest in their care. Remember that eating, eating disorders and anxiety disorders and depression can happen in patients. And so you might wanna make that referral or bring it up to the doctor or bring it up to the patient if you start to notice these types of changes. So at the end of this talk, I would like us to take home a few messages, right? We wanna prevent diabetes when we can by knowing our risk factors and screening for prediabetes and reversing it. If you know about it, you can make the behavioral changes to decrease the risk of developing diabetes. Know your risk, know your numbers, meet your treatment targets, decrease the complications of diabetes and be an active participant in your care like you were told before. Screen regularly and early for complications so that we can prevent the development of complications and so that we can intervene to prevent the progression of complications when they have occurred. We try to detect, we try to detect clinical, subclinical changes like microscopic things even before you develop the problem. And if you're not screening and you're waiting for the development of symptoms, we've allowed things to progress sometimes beyond the point where we can intervene in terms of prevention. Now, I want you to feel empowered by the end of this talk. I want you to feel educated to talk to your doctor and discuss your goals. Doc, what's my A1C? Doc, what's my LDL? Doc, why is my blood pressure not below 130 over 80? You know, why am I not meeting the targets? What can I do to empower myself, to give myself a chance to change my outcome? So education and empowerment is a chance to change your outcome. If diabetes complications are already occurring, we should intervene to prevent the development of new complications and also to prevent the progression of complications if they are already occurring. So I want us to walk away with kind of a sense of hope and not a sense of doom and gloom because we just spent an hour <laughs> or maybe more than that talking about diabetes and all the things that can occur if we don't initiate the lifestyle um, and medication management necessary and if we're not meeting our targets. But I also want it to be seen in a frame of the ability to empower yourself to make the change and change your outcome. And so I think on that note, I'll stop. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Christine Parker Curling. And we'll now have our medical director, Dr. Moxie, entertain questions. I know there are a lot of burning questions. I see a few in the chat. Dr. Moxie, are you there? All right. So good evening, everyone. And so uh, thank you very much to Dr. Christine Parker Curling and to Dr. Ariane Davis Simmons. I think uh, both talks were phenomenal. Uh, we certainly learned a lot and, and we're looking to engage you uh, to help increase our expertise um, uh, moving forward. And so uh, without further ado, I guess we'll start with um, Dr. Davis Simmons. Mm -hmm. Um, how does my doctor determine whether or not, uh, which type of diabetes I have? Great. Um, so there's a couple ways. So usually it's 
going to be quite clear from your history and your presentation. Um, as I alluded to, type 2 being the most common. However, if the diabetes seems atypical, meaning thinner built, younger patient, no strong family history, then that's an aha moment that this may not be a classic type 2. This is likely a type 1 um, diabetes. So how do we screen for that? Um, your doctor will do a C-peptide, which is like a surrogate marker of how much insulin your body is making. And then they'll do autoimmune markers um, to look for those antibodies that destroy uh, the cells that make insulin. So that's kind of how we differentiate the two. But usually it's clear from the history. Okay, great. Uh, Dr. Parker Curlin, my doctor has told me that I have type 1 diabetes and wants to start me on insulin therapy, but I would prefer to start with tablets. Tell me, can that happen? I saw you, Dr. Davidson. Well, you know, <laughs> uh, it depends. And I say that, when I say that, I mean, do you truly have type 1 diabetes? So um, like Dr. David Simmons said, are you a younger patient? Is, this, is there a type one diabetes history in the family? Or, you know, have you been on medications before and now you are requiring insulin? So if you're truly type one, you're not making insulin, you don't have an elevated insulin level, you don't have any C-peptide, then as we talked to uh, about before, you need insulin because in this particular scenario, your pancreas has ceased making insulin. Um, and so oral medications have not been able to treat diabetes in that particular population of patients. So if you're truly type 1 diabetes, no, insulin to date is the only therapy that we have for you. Great, great. Because we know that a lot of patients, oftentimes um, there is resistance um, in terms of initiating therapy with insulin. Uh, and I'm talking about patients that have been diagnosed and, and you're pretty confident that this person has type one. And a lot of it is, you know, a fair factor of injections and everything that comes along with giving insulin. And so, of course, we always try to figure out if we can, um, you know, if there, if there can be another way. And I guess as a follow-up to that, and, and so we'll give uh, some, some time for the audience to also put in some additional questions into the chat. Uh, a follow-up to that, uh, Dr. Davis Simmons, how long does it take for a, um, or do all diabetics eventually end up on insulin? Not all, it, it, it depends. Um, so I think I, there was a slide that I had to show that diabetes are progressive. Um, and that's over time because it can worsen the longer you have diabetes. So some people do require insulin in the end. Um, but not everyone. There are patients who've had diabetes for a while, their body is still making insulin, um, they're doing he healthy lifestyle where they're able to get away with orals or just using orals or um, non-injectable therapy that is not insulin, uh, and then they're managed pretty well. So it really is on a case-by-case -case, um, uh, measure. Okay, great, great, thank you. Uh, for Dr. Parker Curling. Um, in terms of complications um, that you spoke about in your presentation today, um, how long does it usually take for a diabetic to develop uh, complications? And are there any complications that occur more commonly than others? That is a relatively difficult question to answer because it really depends on the degree of control of diabetes. So if you have uncontrolled diabetes, um, you know, your blood sugars are 300, your, your, your hemoglobin A1C is 13, you're more likely to develop complications more quickly. So, you know, it takes time. So you're not, you're not likely to develop things like macrovascular complications in a year or two. It's usually over many years but that time is so variable depending on your other predisposing factors and also depending on your degree of control. Dr. Davis Simmons, do you have anything to add? Yeah, so what I would say is that most type people with type two diabetes has had it for several years before they're right. even diagnosed. Um, so the early changes are already happening. 
Um, and that's why we're all a big component, um, you know, kind of promoting prevention and also promoting getting your annual physical. So these things can be screened uh, appropriately because a lot of people come and said, you know, I didn't know I had it, but these things are going on for many years and they're coming in with, you know, neuropathy, even microalbuminuria. So as, as Christine said, it's variable, Dr. Parker said it's variable, but a lot of people have this disease and just unaware. It is a silent killer. Um, so that's where prevention and follow-up is important. Um, also, I would add to that, Beverton, Dr. Moxie, just one more thing. Um, the recommendations kind of indicate that when they tell us that when you have a type one diabetic patient, after about five years, you want to you want to start screening. When you have a type two diabetic patient, we actually start that screening at diagnosis mm -hmm. because because they've probably been having prediabetes or even overt diabetes for years before they were diagnosed with diabetes. So I suppose I could say minimum of five years based on those recommendations. Um, but the but the um, the recommendation would be to screen at diagnosis, especially for type two diabetic patients. Mm -hmm. Okay, reasonable. great. Um, we have a question in the chat and I'll leave it to either one of you. Is type two diabetes completely reversible? Um, I guess I can take that. Um, so it depends on the duration that you've had it. Um, so I, I mentioned the strong association with obesity. So I'm gonna give you a patient picture. So if you have morbid obesity, obesity, you have type two diabetes, um, significant weight loss and even um, surgical weight loss management can lead to remission of the disease. So that study that I showed, they showed that even, you know, people who are requiring five medications, some of them were on one and a percentage of them were on none. So not for everybody, it is a case by case basis, but by losing significant amount of weight, um, yes, diabetes and changing your lifestyle, it is a potential to be reversible. Now, there's a, another, like, let me give you another example. So there's a patient who's a type two, leaner, significant family history, um, you know, both parents, things like that. And on the leaner side, yes, lifestyle changes may help them, but they may still require some medication because it's not always obesity lifestyle. Those are the major components, um, but there are other risk factors um, that are uh, play a role in terms of, you know, what, how many meds you're going to acquire, things like that. So I would say on a case-by-case -case, um, basis, it is a potential to be re in remission um, in terms of lifestyle and things like that. Okay, great. Christine, anything, what do you think? Anything to add, Christine? <laughs> I'm muted. I said agree. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Oh boy, all right. So there's a question in the chat. Um, and so I'll take a stab at that. So the question was, does Bahamian health cover gastric sleeve and gastric bypass for morbidly obese clients who are at risk for diabetes and other medical conditions? So as it relates to coverage, and I will speak to it and then, um, you know, if, if, if our clinical manager has anything else to add, we can certainly go, go for that. But as it relates to coverage, everybody's their plan is different. And so what I would um, advise you to do, um, if you are a Bahama Health client and you are interested to know what your plan covers, um, it will be great for you to, to call in and speak with either your um, group administrator or one of our client service uh, representatives. And we would be more than happy to go through. And of course, you know, once the physician sends in information, we can certainly um, the, 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 the insurance company looks at, at, at information that is sent in. And so what I would encourage you to do is essentially speak with your plan um, administrator and, and our client service reps. Uh, moving on to the next question. And I think we were talking a little bit about um, diabetes complications and diabetic uh, complications. And so the, um, the, a follow-up to that is if I have developed a complication, um, can this be um, reverse, um, such as um, is there or is there a way of reversing it? And, and I guess an example would be <clears throat> numbness in the feet or some um, maybe neur neuropathy. Um, if, are there any, any um, 
possible scenarios where complications are reverse are reversible. Okay, um, so that's a complicated question. Uh, in terms of things like, let's speak about retinopathy. Uh, a lot of times the answer to the question is kind of no, except the improved blood sugar control will prevent progression of the complications, which is why we try to intervene early. In terms of things like diabetic nephropathy, or, or if we can detect uh, minimal amounts of protein in the urine, perhaps you can have improvement in that particular index with the addition of the ACE inhibitors that are, are proven to be renal protective. But if you've already started to have decline in, in kidney function, at that point, what we're doing is we're doing everything we can to maintain the kidney function where it is and to prevent further progression. In terms of diabetic neuropathy, there are, there are things we can do to improve symptom control. But in terms of reversal to the damage of the nerves that's already occurring, uh, that would be very difficult to reverse. And I don't know if there's any evidence-based uh, intervention to reverse diabetic neuropathy at this point, Dr. Davis Simmons. No, it's a, I agree with you. No, I agree with what you're saying. So it really depends on if it is, there are some neuropathies that are transient and there's some that are permanent. So, you know, you have patients who may be newly diagnosed type two and they're coming in with, oh, I have some numbness and tingling. And then that does improve with good sugar control. But again, once the permanent damage has already happened um, to the nerves, then yes, I agree with you, it's not reversible. So it's maybe more, early on, maybe early. Early, yeah, earlier in the process, if they have, you know, a few things. Um, same thing with the, the, di the diabetic eye disease. You can see some improvement with good blood sugar control, um, but it's all about um, preventing the progression if able to. All right, great. Um, so I think in the talk, both, both uh, of our presenters uh, this evening would have emphasized um, the importance of diet. Um, um, playing a significant role in the management of, a di of diabetes. And so the question is, what resources uh, do we have all available to patients locally uh, to assist with that and with meal planning? Um, okay, so yes, so the cornerstone is going to be lifestyle change, uh, lifestyle changes. Um, so that would be working with a di dietitian, um, a registered dietitian, or working with your diabetes educator. Um, if you're unable to do that, even working, find online, American Diabetes Association has free information um, to assist you in diet planning um, for diabetes. Um, and then we have the Diabetes Research Institute that also has um, information um, on diet and lifestyle. So there's many resources, um, but I, I usually refer patients to American Diabetes Association because there's tons of free resources there. Um, there's information information on support groups so you can link with um, other people similar to you around the world um, um, for social support. Okay, so we're going to take one last question. Um, and so, and I'd like to actually get the perspective from both of mm -hmm. the physicians. Um, why, why do you think that we have such a high incidence of diabetes in the Bahamas and what can we do to change it? Christine, oh. I'll, okay, go sure. ahead. Oh, yeah. no, no, you start. We're gonna alternate. You start. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Sure. Um, I think you alluded to in the talk uh, in terms of type two diabetes, which is a, a disease characterized by insulin resistance, which is exacerbated by excess body weight and obesity. Uh, I would say that our increase in diabetes prevalence and incidence is kind of mirroring our increase in average body mass index. Um, and that's a complicated issue because I believe that uh, our, our sedentary lifestyle is, is, is one of the major components. And then of course, the, the composition of our plate. And so I think it's a, the reason I say it's a complicated issue is because it's cultural. It's almost like we are trained from a very young age uh, in terms of what our palate preferences will be to prefer meals that are very densely populated with carbohydrates. So we usually have three carbs on one plate and maybe a protein and, and that protein is barbecued, which is covered in carbs. 
So we've trained our palates to have a diet very rich in carbohydrates. And then we also do not participate regularly in physical activity, even in terms of getting around, getting around our small town. If you're walking, we kind of look at you, well, why is she walking? in? think she's going to get it. So culturally, walking is either, well, he's walking, he has has lost, he's taken absence of his senses, or, you know, so it's um, walking is, is kind of looked down upon in a certain way. So we have decreased physical activity, increased carbohydrate, and culturally, the other part of that is, Culturally, we like, we like to be solid. So I've had patients who've lost weight for other reasons to say, now, doc, people asking me what's wrong. We need to put this weight back on me. And so it sounds paradoxical, but they are very serious and they are extremely serious. So I think there are multiple issues that lead to the development of diabetes at, at, at the high level that it is in our population. And I guess finally, I would say, if we're not screening, we're missing it too. So I'm gonna stop and let Dr. Davis Simmons finish. Yeah, you know, you hit the you hit the nail on the head. It is our the obesity epi epidemic that is here, uh, and that is why we're seeing a lot of diabetes. And then a couple, like you said, coupled with that is decrease um, exercise. But then we also have a, st a strong genetic um, predisposition. So we have factors that we can change, modifiable factors, and we have non-modifiable factors. So we're mostly a country of blacks, right? So Afro-Caribbean. So that just being that increases your risk. Uh, and then we're layering it on with, with how we eat, uh, obesity, not getting enough um, exercise, things like that. So I would, I would say change the things we can. So we need to change uh, in terms of our waistline. Everybody needs to be cinched in a bit. Um, and th this concept of the solid, uh, it's, 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 it's bizarre. So, you know, we are now skewed to think being overweight is normal. Um, so it, and it changes from, we have to change it from, from, from child. It has to be changed in the household because we're seeing more children with obesity, more children with type two diabetes. Uh, and we're just setting them up with failure. You know, this whole concept where you have to clean your plate and finish everything. Um, so they're not even listening to the cues of their body. I feel full. I need to stop eating. Um, so I want to say it just needs to start early uh, in terms of uh, how we see food, our relationship with food, getting healthy uh, so that we can prevent the obesity, prevent um, um, the diabetes. Okay, great. Uh, thank you once again to uh, Dr. Parker Curling and Dr. Ariane Davis-Simmons uh, for such an excellent presentation and for um, just... Uh, being so forthcoming and so open and so we truly appreciate it. I am going to turn this back over to Nurse Moss to close us out for the evening and it was a pleasure. Hey, Dr. Moss, we have the manager of our business development, Mrs. Tanya Stirrup, that will be closing us out. Tanya? Thank you. Thank you, Nurse Moss. On behalf of the management and staff of Bahama Health and Family Guardian, we want to thank you, Dr. Arian Davis Simmons and Dr. Christine Parker Curling for presenting on such a timely topic this evening that is impacting our Bahamian society. We appreciate you taking the time out from your busy schedule to share valuable information on diabetes, which I am certain our audience got some great nuggets and on this disease and is now better informed to make healthy lifestyle decisions. We also thank our listening audience for being with us this evening on this platform. You could have been anywhere else, but you chose to be here with us. So we are thankful to you all. And we wish each and every one of you this evening a pleasant good evening. And thank you all so much for joining us. Have a good evening, everyone.